The first thing is I will not use PowerPoint. I strongly believe that power corrupts a politician and PowerPoint corrupts the professor. So I will just, <coughs> I'll just be sharing stories with you, issues with you. In some sense, building up with that, I would have loved to acknowledge them at each stage, but you will find the connections. I'm going to actually tell you stories. Albert Einstein, there's a story about him that when he was a professor at Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, he gave a question paper for that exam. And normally professors have teaching assistants to whom they give the paper, and then he does all the logistics. So this teaching assistant is also bright. He looks at the paper, he says, sir, this is exactly the same paper you gave last year. And Einstein said, but the answers have changed. I think this is what is very important. Of course, what Einstein said was probably in the context of his four papers which he had published. In one year, he published four papers, one on special relativity, one on general relativity, one on Brownian motion, and one on the photoelectric effect. Each of them was worthy of a Nobel Prize. Of course, he was given a Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect. But the point I'm trying to make is, 1905, the world changed over one year. And what we are seeing today, and I think Korshak talked about it, that 2022, so we all look at 2020 or 2022 and see a world which is very different from the world that was there in the past. Good, bad, indifferent is what we will make of it. So the question that I am addressing, which remains the same but the answers change, is what is worth learning? We are all in the education business. I've been an academic for more than 50 years. But did we ever ask, why are we teaching this? All of you would have done mathematics in your school stage. And all of you would have learned how to find the third side of a triangle given two sides and the internal angle. Whoever needed this thing in life, except for maybe math teacher teaching in school. The question is that 90% of what we teach has actually no bearing. And nobody wants to look into why we are teaching that. It is some tradition which is there. It used to be taught, therefore. You could argue that, no, this actually, when you do all this math at the school level, you are really learning deductive reasoning. We don't call it deductive reasoning. We call it mathematics. But most of mathematics is deductive reasoning. But you could learn deductive reasoning from solving the mysteries of Sherlock Holmes or any other detective stories. So the question that is, why is this question staring at us now? You are all grown up enough to realize that our education system is in a complete mess. Sienna Rao, who's our only Bharatratna in science, said right in the Rashpati Bhavan that 90% of the curricula prescribed by UGC and ASIT is out of date. This is not some informal conversation, but nothing has been done about it. I think I will go a little bit to emphasize why this has become so important. And because you are all technology people, and some mention is made about technology, let me give you a quick snapshot of what is happening. And we talked about this 2022 and so on. Long years ago, in what would be called the pre-technological age, the only source of energy was muscular power. Whether it was manual labor, which is why men were more important than women, because they had more muscular power, physical power. And then you had simple machines, which you study in class eight physics, the lever, the inclined plane, the pulley, and you see the Taj Mahal, the Konarak temple, the pyramids of Egypt, they were all built with just this technology. But it needed tens of thousands of people working for 20 years or more. The first industrial revolution happened when we discovered the power of steam. And once we discovered the power of steam, one direction was locomotion, as in steam engines. And the other was the boilers in the factories. And that was the first industrial age, where from cottage industry kind of thing, you could have factories, 
and you recently saw NTPC boiler story, but that was a major part. This happened around 1780s. It continued merrily for about 100 years, when suddenly this guy called Edison, <coughs> he discovered the electric lamp. But Edison is a very interesting character. He's not just a lone inventor who discovered the electric lamp and was very happy that I discovered the electric lamp. He said, how will the lamp be lit if there is no electricity generation or electricity distribution? The field in which Samir Gupta is. So he decided that he needs to create electricity, distribute electricity, and also find investors for his company. And many of you would know the company is called General Electric. It was the first company which brought in all this kind of a thing. We don't know so much about Edison and Tesla, who were the founders. We know more about Jack Welch, who was the flashy CEO of that company. But there is something else which happened. Until the discovery of this whole electrical thing, what happened was the oil companies were quite easy doing what the person had said, easy, safe target. So they made kerosene oil, lamp oil, kerosene oil sold all over the world. They were doing well. They did not push themselves hard. When Thomas Edison did this, they were pushed to that hard to become that extra marathon or triathlon or iron man or whatever. And they started developing petrol engines and diesel engines. And therefore, we had, for about 100 years, a glorious time with petrol engines, diesel engines, electrical engines, electric motors, electric power, everything going electric. Till about 1969, when it from electric, it started going electronic. So in the electric age, automation was by electromagnetic break and make and break circuits, like an electric bell or the self of a car. Around 1970, we had full-fledged electronics. And therefore, radio, TV, computers, etc., started coming. And I'm emphasizing this. This is called the third industrial age. And this is why IITs, etc., prospered. Because IITs were created in 1961. Their first graduates came around 1966. They were ready for the third industrial age because they had seen computers, they had seen big machines, they had seen special equipment, they had a great library, and so on. And what Klaus Schwab said in January 2016 is that we are now entering the fourth industrial age. And the fourth industrial age is a very interesting one, which is a fusion of what were so far three different things. There was what is called the physical world, and then you had the IT world. So you had a computer center, director of computing, computer department, and you had the biological world, which was in hospitals and so on. What is seeing? We are now seeing the fusion of all these three worlds. So the physical world of atoms and energy, the information world of bits and qubits, because quantum computing is on the horizon, and the biological world of genes and neurons. So now you know that just like you edit software, you can have a technology called CRISPR, which can edit genes and create completely new products. So this future that we are talking about is very different. And in terms of what you need to know, it's quite different. As earlier, specialization was important. So I'm an engineer, I'm a doctor, I'm an electrical engineer, I'm a high power engineer, I'm a microelectronics engineer, and so on. Today, you're looking at a person who can cut across this. And for the special stuff, there will be technology available, which will get you the thing. So a comprehensive understanding, including human values and insights, because what are you doing it in aid of? So these things are the things that we are talking about today. And this is where the big mismatch is. You can blame people on anything. There is no institution defined for preparing people for the fourth industrial age, unlike the IITs and institutions in their image, which were clearly designed that this is what is happening and this is what we are preparing for. So where do we end up? I'll try to manage my time by spending a few more minutes on general principles and then try to give something towards the answer. And of course, for people who want to continue conversation, I'm available in electronic form. There are two views to what is worth learning. One is what is called the classical utilitarian view of Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill. And they believe that only one thing is of value is it desirable to be learned. So they will ask the question, 
If you are an engineer, what can you do that is useful for society? And the largest good of the largest number was the broader principle. On the other hand, were people like Socrates, who believed that knowledge is its own reward. There's this famous story of Socrates that on the day that he was to have poison, earlier evening, he learned to play a new tune on a flute. And when asked, but why are you doing this? He says, so that I know one more thing before I die. So there is no utilitarianism, there is no possible advantage. And of course, Bali was a long, long time away that he could say, I've planned something. But that is the point. Third view comes from people like Bertrand Russell, who has a very famous essay on useless knowledge, who tries to say that knowledge may look useless today, but it can become very important tomorrow. So don't judge a piece of knowledge by what it does for you today. Examples are, many of you are studying electrical engineering or the complex number i. When you say square root of minus one, it looks like a complete abstract thing. But can you do AC circuits without using i? No. Prime numbers, a complete abstract concept. There you go on adding numbers one and one, and suddenly some numbers are not divisible by any other number. It was only something for the pure mathematician. Today, you cannot have cyber security without prime numbers at all. The most famous algorithm, RSA algorithm, is about factorizing something for which the factors are large prime numbers. So RSA 129 was 64 digit and 65 digit prime numbers and so on. So this is the other aspect. If you look at things today, many things which about 10 years, 20 years ago were purely theoretical constructs have become very practical. I will quickly now, just looking at the time, try to emphasize to you one very important thing which is happening, and I especially mean it for students who are right here. I mentioned that story about electricity to you at great length, because today, Andrew Nugg, who's a leader in AI, has said AI is the new electricity. What you understand from that is that just like we move from manual and uh, steam, et cetera, to electric versions of all kinds of things. Everything will move the AI way. And you may be whatever you want. If you are not going to be familiar with AI, you are going to be not in the mainstream. You may still be somewhere, but not in the mainstream. And it's not Andrew Nugg alone who is saying that. Putin, recently in September, and spoke to a number of students in Russia. I think it was about 14,000 schools, 1 million students, like his version of monkey bath. And what he said is that AI is the new future. Any country which leads in AI will lead the world. And there is a lot of sense to that, because let me take you back. In the early days after the Second World War, America was the leading country in technology. They made the hydrogen bomb, they made the atom bomb, and they had all the kind of stuff and they always believed the Russians were copying from them and cheating because they made the same things a little later. But on 4th October 1957, Russia threw the Sputnik. And the Americans said, but we don't have it, so how could they have copied it from us? And Barack Obama very often called that as the Sputnik moment. I think Putin is trying to draw this, that Russia will lead the world in AI. It may have not led the world in the previous digital thing. So, all the Microsoft and Facebook and Oracle, et cetera, were from US, but what they're trying to say, the AI world will be Russia's world. So that's what they, so what I'm trying to say, that is something which is very important. To wrap up from these generalities to specifics, so what should you be actually learning? You should not bother about any subjects. In fact, one very few interesting feature is said, if you're School is teaching you something which can be automated. There is no point in learning it. Humans will do what automation cannot. So you learn about automation, but do that. So learning to learn is very important. Uh, becoming a lifelong learner is very important. He, somebody said that at the age of 50, he went to Harvard to learn again. I think many people will have to do this. And the reason for this is increased longevity. Most of us will live much longer than our previous generations. Already data says in the developing advanced country, a child born today will live for 104 years. In Japan, it is 110 years. 50% of the children will live that. So that, then learning to think is very important. 
because we are not in the age of fake news, fake this thing, all kinds of things. So creative thinking, critical thinking, <coughs> mathematical modeling, computational thinking become very important. Awareness of new technologies, big data, blockchain, quantum computing, AI, machine intelligence, all this will become part of routine. A very important aspect is becoming human. So understanding Homo sapiens, the evolution process from where we became Homo sapiens. About 70,000 years ago, we separated from Neanderthals, and there were reasons for that, because we were very good in imagination and working with strangers. Ethics and values. He talked about Harvard. See, Harvard has the famous galaxy of Harvard graduates who are in jail, including Enron chief, our Rajat Gupta just came out of jail, and they started worrying that we taught them to be competitive, successful, but what about ethics and values? So Clayton Christensen has emphasized this and created a course on that. We need to see, start anticipating the future of work. The future of work is not an extension of what you are seeing today. Five to 10 years later, the method of working will change. It is what is being called the gig economy, where what you do is what matters. And therefore, for that, you need to have negotiation skills, you need to have networking skills. If you do not have networking skills, you are probably not working in the future. So the whole point is that from the academic curriculum, the shift has happened to who you are. And the emphasis is now education for behavioral change. So I learn, and you can then see, you can see instances that you can say, yes, this person is from a great institute because that has made a change on his behavior. Great people who accomplished have never been asked the certificates or degrees. They've been asked what they did for mankind. I think this is the essence of what we are saying. It's a longish discussion. We'll take some time. We are already through with this thing. I'm quite happy to have question and answer after the formal TED recording is over. So I wish you all a great future. The fourth industrial age is upon us. It is anybody's game. There is no institution which has been designed. If you decide to do all this, you are. And even if you don't do it institutionally, you can do it individually. More than 60% of data scientists, which is a very hot career today, well paid and everything, are people who have self-taught and who have learned from MOOCs. Because you know there was no master's program in data science. So many other subjects which are emerging will happen by your own effort. Of course, being in a good institution gives you the strength to be able to learn things on your own and become a self-directed learner. All the best and thank you.